Right, oh, good morning, everybody. Welcome along. This is our business law series. It's our pleasure to have Alan Nogsley along from Rainey Collins Lawyers in Wellington. And I'll come back to Alan in a moment. Stephen Caunter is my name. I'm one of the business training managers with the ANZ. Now, this session will run for about an hour. Uh, in terms of questions, uh, we'll either deal with them during the session, sort of in the now, or we will have time at the end and we will we will answer all of your questions as appropriate. Now, it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome Alan. Alan and I, we've done some sessions together on this very subject, uh, certainly a few years ago now, but I've always enjoyed uh, Alan's presentation style and the, the message that he delivers. So uh, from the ANZ team, Alan, welcome and thank you for your time. The, the information that uh, we're that is uh, being presented to you is, is a general nature uh, for as many different businesses that are, that are uh, on the call uh, or joining the webinar, there are different situations. And so I think the key message is that if you are um, dealing with employment matters, dealing with legal matters, that taking your own um, particular legal advice or support from professionals that you rely on is absolutely critical. It's over to you now, Alan, and um, I'll leave them in your capable hands through until the end. So thank you and over to you. Thanks, Stephen. Hello, everybody. So just first slide is just a little bit about me, just my background. Um, I've been involved in employment law for over 30 years. So I've had a bit of experience and what I've done today is put together some of the issues which I think are the normal ones that keep employers awake at night. Uh, and we'll go through those and chat about them with you and see if I can give you some practical guides as to how to avoid those or deal with them should they pop up. So what keeps people awake at night? I'll, I'll talk about things like hiring, how to go about hiring, uh, what to do about employment agreements, long-term sickness, poor performance, discipline issues, how to deal with bullying or a poor culture, and also redundancies and restructures. Those are the main issues that, that we'll deal with. But if you've got other questions about any other area of, of employment law, don't hesitate to throw those in the chat and we can um, deal with those as well if we've got time. Bearing in mind that I would normally talk for about an hour on each of these topics, today is a pretty much a, a light gloss over all of the topics. Uh, and so I'm very happy to dig into more depth on any particular thing as we go along. Right, so when you're hiring, when you're hiring people, you've got to remember uh, your obligation as an employer, um, which is one of good faith. And the employee has that obligation as well, of course. They're mutual. Um, you've got to be fair, you've got to be reasonable, and you've got to communicate in an open way with your employees. So you can't take people by surprise, you can't ambush them. For example, um, you cannot um, trick them into things, you've got to be open with them. Now, when you're hiring, it's, it's really important to get the person who's going to fit your organisation. Um, fit is, I think, one of the most important things to get. And one way you can find out if you've got the right fit is to go through a a background check and an interview. Um, interviews are really important. We used to always do them in person. These days, quite a few of them are done on Zoom. So there's some different techniques and things, of course, on Zoom. It's harder to tell body language and things like that. So just be aware of that when you're interviewing people, um, just to try and get the right fit. Really important to do some background checks. Now, it depends on what business you're in as to what level of background check you need, um, but there are a variety of background checks. Uh, for example, one might be their criminal record, if they've got one. You might want someone who doesn't have a criminal record or it might not matter to you um, whether they do or they don't. Um, in our firm, of course, we have to do a criminal record check to make sure people aren't frauds uh, and stealing money all over the place. That wouldn't be a good look. You might also want to do a credit check. Um, if someone owes money all over the place, they may not be suitable for your organization either. So you can get credit checks done. They're available from a, from a number of reputable uh, agencies and you can just find them online quite easily. 
The other important thing to do when, you, when you've done your interview is to follow up with any referees. Now, some people skip over that step and I find that really incredible because referees can provide you really good information. Um, bear in mind that this person, the referee will have been chosen by the employee. So they're not independent. They are an advocate for the employee usually. But if you ask the right questions, you can, you can get good information. Now, a referee might give you an answer. It's really important that you drill down on that answer. If you ask them for something and they give you an answer, ask them why they've given you that answer. Why have they said that? And then when they give you an answer to that, ask them again, why have they answered that way? Drill down until you're satisfied you're well below the superficial answers and you're getting to the real character of the person who you're interviewing. Uh, because the employer will find it quite hard to lie um, because they'll know that they can be made liable if they give you false information. So keep a careful eye on them when you're asking the questions. If there's a big delay when you ask somebody something, it may not be true. Oops, I'll just go back one there. One, one thing that I really think you should ask them as a sort of final question is, would they hire the person again themselves? And that's any hesitation there. And you know that the answer they're about to give you is probably not true. So just be well aware of that. Um, most people won't lie in that situation or they'll be very uncomfortable lying. And you can pick that up just by watching them. So as I said, getting the right fit is very important. I think you can train people uh, on skills, but you cannot train fit. So you need someone who's gonna fit into your organization. And that will differ from place to place as to what the right fit is. Now, once you've decided to hire someone, you've got to offer them an employment agreement and all employment agreements must be in writing. So really important that you provide them an employment agreement. Um, and it has to be before they start and it has to be signed by both parties. So you need to have an agreement which includes the sort of stuff which is required to have. And then you need to also have in your agreement the sort of things that you want to have in the agreement. You're also required to take copies of the agreement and to keep copies. Now, this is not just the one they sign, but also includes any drafts that you've provided to them for them to consider. So say, for example, you send them out a, a, an employment agreement with a, as a draft, and they come back and they renegotiate a few points, and then you sign up a, a new agreement. You've got to keep any drafts you send them, and it might have changed several times from the original as you've been going through the negotiations. You've got to keep copies of all those drafts. And if you don't do that, you can be fined, and the fines are quite substantial. They're in the thousands for, for not doing that. And you can also be fined if you have no written agreement as well. So just bear that in mind. You must have written agreements and they should be signed by both parties and you should sign them before they start. Now, another reason to have them signed before they start is if you're going for a 90 day trial period in, the, in your agreement. Um, you can only have a 90 day trial period if you're under 20 employees, but you can also only have a 90 day trial period if they've never worked for you before as an employee. And if they start work and then you get the employment agreement signed afterwards with that 90 day trial clause, the Employment Relations Authority in court says that you must, they, they've been working for you already before they signed. So the 90 day trial period won't be effective. Now, someone's asked, how long do you have to keep those agreements? You must keep them for as long as they're employed by you, and you should keep them for at least six years afterwards as well. So, so you need to hang on to them for a long time and you need to be able to find them. So make sure your system is adequate for finding them. You don't have to keep them in hard copy. You can keep electronic copies, but you must be able to find them. And if you can't find them, you won't be believed as to what was in the agreement and so forth. So make sure that you do hang on to those. Right, things you must have in the agreement. So you must have the names of the parties. Now, 
that might seem to be pretty basic, but it's amazing how many times I see employment agreements which have either no names in it or the wrong names. For example, someone might have taken a precedent which is from the prior employee and they've got their name in it, not the new employee, or else they haven't even named their own organization correctly. For example, if you're a company, the company must be correctly named. Um, and if you're a trust, the trust must be correctly named. If you're an incorporated society, the incorporated society must be correctly named. And by correctly named, it also means including the words limited or incorporated. Um, you must have those in there. If you don't have those in there, then the directors and the people running the organization can be personally liable as employers. So you don't want that to occur because the whole purpose of having the um, having the company or the incorporated society is to avoid that personal liability. So make sure you correctly name the parties. Now, another chat just popped up asking about whether the documents have to be kept as PDFs. All you need to do is to keep a copy. So um, you need to keep a copy which is unable to be changed. Now, people think that PDFs are unable to be changed. That's not actually correct. Um, there's software available whereby you can open up a PDF, you can change it. So what you need to do is just get the person to sign each page and then keep a copy of that. A PDF is better than a Word document, obviously, but it doesn't really matter what format you keep it in so long as you can show that that's what was actually signed. So now the other thing to have along with the name of the parties is you must have their role in the agreement. Now that's not a job description. You don't have to say all the tasks they're gonna do. It's just what their role is. Are they the rocket scientist or are they the cleaner? So you must put that in. You must also say where they will work. Now, if you've only got one site, you can just name that site. But I would also suggest you add in a clause that says it's anywhere else that you reasonably direct them to work in the vicinity. So someone has now also asked, are there any tips for signing agreements digitally? There is plenty of software about whereby you can get um, validated signatures onto documents. Um, but I, I prefer, if you can, to get them signed in hard copy, um, because that way there's, there's no argument that someone else has attached signatures and stuff like that. But there are certainly software about whereby you can get validated signatures. Now, just going back to what you must have and where they will work, if you've got more than one site, you should, you should refer to all the sites, plus have that general clause about anywhere else they're directed. If you change the workplace, you don't need to get a new employment agreement um, just because you've changed where you're working. Um, and if it's within the locality or reasonably reasonable distance from your locality, then they can't say that they don't have to turn up to work. They still have to come along to your new workplace. You must also state in the agreement what hours they'll work. Now, it depends on your workplace how you do that. That might well be something like 8 till 5 or 8.30 till 5 or whatever it happens to be. Or it could be by way of a roster and you would specify that it's, the roster will be produced on a certain time in advance and that sort of thing. So you can do it a number of ways, but you must set out in the contract and the employment agreement how you will tell them what their hours are and what the minimum hours will be. You've also got to have a particular clause about what happens if you want them to work on a public holiday. Now, you don't have to make people work on a public holiday, but if you want them to work on a public holiday, you must put that right in your agreement. And you must also state that if you do ask them to work on a public holiday, what will happen about their pay? And that will be time and a half, plus they'll get an extra day off in lieu of the public holiday at some other point by agreement. Now, if they do actually end up working on a public holiday when you've asked them to, you only pay for the hours they work at time and a half. So say, for example, you ask them to pop in for an hour, you just pay one hour at time and a half. But you have to provide a full day in lieu. So they'll get the rest of that public holiday and then they'll get another whole day in lieu. So just be aware of that when you're asking people to come in on public holidays. 
You've also got to have a particular clause in particular wording about restructuring and redundancies. And that is a set, a set uh, wording. So you must have that in there. And it talks about consulting with the new employer when you're selling your business or outsourcing, whether they'll take the person on and then how you will discuss that with the employees and so forth. But you must have that in there. You've also got to have one about how you resolve disputes and telling them that they've got 90 days to raise any personal grievance. Once again, the wording for that is fairly strict. It's got to set out that they can go to the MB Employment uh, Relations, sorry, MB Mediation, and then if that's not settled, they can go off to the Employment Relations Authority and the Employment Court and so forth. So those are the only things that you must have in your employment agreement. But of course, there are many, many things that you'll want to have in addition to that. So there are some things which are a good idea to have. One of the most important ones I feel is they must follow all policies and procedures. Now, whatever you do, don't put all your policies and procedures into your employment agreement. Now, don't set out what the mileage rate is for um, car reimbursement and that sort of thing. Don't set out um, what your drug testing policy is in your employment agreement. Just say that they must follow all policies and procedures. Now, the reason for not putting them in your employment agreement is if you do that and you want to make any change, you have to get agreement from each employee to change their employment agreement, and they may not agree. Whereas if you just have them in your policies, you can change the policies at any time you want to. All you need to do is to make them aware of the change and then apply the new policy from once you've made them aware of it. So you can change the policy on drug testing at any time, and you just tell them what the new policy is. So for goodness sake, don't put all your policies and so forth into your employment agreements. You also want to put in an ability to suspend while you're investigating serious misconduct. If you don't have that in there, it can be difficult to suspend employees while you're carrying out an investigation, uh, except for some things like violence, where it's not good to have the people sitting next to one another while you're investigating but put in the clause that allows you to suspend and then you can do that suspension. And we'll talk more about suspensions when we talk about dealing with discipline and so forth shortly. You also want to, net, want to have a clause allowing you to deduct any money that they might owe you. That's important to have in there, but remember that you still need to get particular consent at the time. In other words, what amount and how, how often it'll be taken out and so forth if they owe you money. Now. You need to consider whether you need to protect any intellectual property that you might have and that they might be party to. Um, you don't want them taking your working procedures or your client lists or your charges and all that sort of thing, going to the opposition or setting up next door to you. So make sure you have some clauses about protecting your intellectual property and also restraining them from taking your clients or fellow staff for a period. And there are numerous clauses you can put in about the geographical area, the length of time and so forth, but just consider what you need to protect your interests there. We've talked about not putting all your policies in. Now, a couple of things that you might consider. We've talked about the 90 day trial. You have to have under 20 employees, must be in the agreement. You must use the particular wording, which I talked about earlier, and they may not have worked for you before in any capacity. If we look now at fixed term agreements, I think these are, are misused often. And um, one of the reasons that people often misuse them is they think that it's a good way of being able to get rid of someone if they need to. And it can't be used for that purpose. It's not to test whether someone is suitable or not. There must be a reasonable and genuine reason for the fixed term. Now, funding is not a genuine reason. Say, for example, you get funding to do a project. You cannot say it's because you, you don't have funding or you only might have funding for the project. The, the reason why you're only taking them on for a fixed term is that it's a one-off project and you're only hiring them for that project. So you shouldn't have a series of projects whereby they go from one to, other, to another and to another on a fixed term. That's not a genuine reason. You should take them on as a, as a permanent employee and then if you don't have a project or funding at the end of that period, you carry out a restructuring and redundancy process. 
and the court's getting very strict on that. Oops, go back one. You can have it, of course, for temporary cover. Uh, and a good example of that is maternity leave, uh, which is now called parental care leave because it covers both parents, of course, not just uh, maternity leave. And you would there not necessarily have a fixed actual date for the end of their work, but you would say that it's for the length of the maternity leave and that the person may come back earlier. I've just got another chat which has popped up. I'm just having a look. And it's a question asking, can you put them on a fixed term to judge whether they are capable of performing in a new role? And the answer to that is no, you can't do that. Um, what you should do is you should have a bit of a trial in the new role um, and perhaps temporarily appoint them to that new role for the period of the trial. Um, and that would be suitable, but they remain your employee throughout and their employment does not come to an end by way of a fixed term. What would come to an end would be their sitting in that position within your organisation, but they remain employed. So, so their employment doesn't come to an end, but that's not a real fixed term employment agreement. It's a fixed term um, trial. Right, so the next topic to cover is long-term sickness. Now, it's really important that you consider how long you can carry the employee in their role with them not being there. Because if you carry them for too long, that will put a big strain on other people uh, and becomes a health and safety issue for those other people if you're expecting others to fill in for them and so forth. So just consider how long can you carry on without that person being able to attend? Can you get temporary cover? Can you find someone? Um, and even if you can find someone, is it financially viable to have a temporary cover for that role? Or do you need to find a permanent person at a much more reasonable rate um, and that you can then bring the, the long-term sick person's employment to an end? You must base all your decisions on medical evidence it's really important to make sure they go to see their doctor and get a report. And that that report talks about when they'll be able to come back um, so that you can set deadlines for their return and that you can talk to their doctor about whether that's going to be partial duties or full duties and what sort of duties they might be. Do you have light duties available or do you not? And that sort of thing. You might also want to send them to a medical person of your choice. So you consider having that in your employment agreements as well, if that's going to be helpful. Uh, requiring them to attend perhaps an occupational um, specialist who can give a more in-depth report. Because remember, many GPs will give a, a medical certificate, but it won't actually be detailed enough for what you need. So you might need to consider getting your own report. If you do get your own report, then of course you need to pay for that. If they've got, uh, if they're off on ACC, they will probably have a case officer who will be working with you on a return to work plan. So you should work closely with that ACC case officer to make sure the return to work plan is something which suits your business as well as the return of the employee as well. So just, just be careful to make sure that fits in. Long term sickness is, is not usually a problem. And it's much easier to deal with if it's a real long-term sickness. Now, for example, if they're going to be off for a long time because of a heart attack or a stroke or something like that, you can decide whether you keep them or you don't keep them. What's much more difficult to deal with is the person who is episodically sick. So in other words, they might have a mental health issue. They're off for a period. They say they can come back. Their doctor says they can come back. They come back. They perform reasonably well for a while and then they get sick again and they're away again, and you find yourself back to square one. Those are the ones which are really difficult to deal with, um, and you really just have to get that medical evidence to support whether they're actually going to be able to perform in the role they're required to perform at all the time, because you can't carry someone who's going to be coming in and out, leaving you in the lurch all the time. So the next thing I want to talk about is 
poor performance and an improvement process for poor performance. And the really important words here are the improvement process. This is not a process for getting rid of people who are poor performers. That might be the outcome should they not improve, but it's not the purpose of the process. The purpose of the process is to improve their performance. So just bear that in mind as you're going through this. That's what you're looking to, to achieve. You've got to set standards which are reasonable. In other words, are you expecting this person to perform at a higher level than everyone else who's doing the same sort of job with the same sort of qualifications? Or are you being reasonable? So set those standards. Also, you need to set standards which you can measure. Because if you can't measure something, it's very hard to say that someone is not achieving it. So you need to pick things which you can measure. So for example, don't have something about you shouldn't gossip. That's very hard to measure. Whereas you can say something like, you will remain at your workstation while you're on shift, something like that. So they can't wander off uh, all over the place chatting to people. You need to consider whether you need to arrange any help or training. Is it an issue which can be improved by training? So can you send them on a course to work a computer better? Can you send them on a course to do something else? Um, can you put in place a mentor or something like that? So that you can measure those, you can give them that training, and then if they don't improve, you can decide whether you're going to keep them on or not. One thing you don't have to offer extra training for is if they've claimed in their CV and an interview that they can already do the tasks which they now say they can't do. Say, for example, they say they're proficient in a particular um, computer program or whatever, and then you find they don't know their way around that at all. That's not a performance issue. That is a discipline issue. They've lied to you, and you can deal with that as a discipline issue. You don't have to provide them with training. Now, you might decide that, in fact, you do want to provide them with the training because, in fact, they've been pretty good in all other aspects, and it's only this thing that they're not very good at, and some training might help. So you can, you can work around that, but you're not required to. Now, you've got to set deadlines for them to reach the required standards. And those deadlines have to be reasonable. When are you expecting them to be able to perform as you require? And you should measure those and monitor them as you're going along. Don't wait till the deadline runs out and then tell them they haven't reached it. If you notice that they're not doing it as you want, tell them as they're going. That gives them the chance to improve. And you should discuss that as they're going along and, and let them know what they're, what they're achieving and what they're not achieving. It's really important to talk to them when you're going through this process about what they're doing really well. Um, it's amazing the psychology of it. If you talk to people about stuff they're doing really well, and then you add in something which they're not doing so well and talk to them about how they can do better at that, they're much more likely to lift their performance in that area than if you only concentrate on the poor performing areas. If you build them up with their confidence in the good areas, you will get better results than if you only concentrate on the poor areas. So just bear that in mind when you're going through the performance improvement process. Now, you've got to decide what the deadlines are. You've got to decide what the standard is, but you've got to be reasonable, as I've said in that. If they fail to reach that standard, then you can decide whether you're going to dismiss them or not. And you go through another, another process to tell them that you're looking at dismissing them. You give them an opportunity to comment on that and to have a support person and so forth. While you're going through the performance improvement process, it's often helpful to get them to bring a support person to meetings because it's very stressful for people and sometimes they don't remember what's talked about. And if they've got a support person present, they can chat with that person afterwards and that person can help them to remember what the important issues were, what they were going to do and so forth. And it's not just for their benefit, but that also helps you as well um, because that helps the person get up to standard. So really important to offer them that support. The next one that really causes a lot of issues is disciplinary thing. And this is one of the things which I see most often done wrongly. People leap to conclusions. 
Uh, hold on, before I go into this, I've just got another question pop up. And it's to do with the 90 day probationary period while you're doing a performance re review. If someone's under a 90 day trial period and you're doing a performance review, you should tell them what they're not performing well at, but and give them that opportunity to improve. But you can dismiss them within that 90 day trial period without any reason. So if you're just not happy with them, you can. Oh, OK, so they're saying it's not a trial period, right? So it's a probationary period. Yes. Yeah, so what during a probationary period, you do need to go through with the same sort of performance review that you would go through with any employee at any stage. Um, it's not really any different in the requirements. You need to tell them what it is they're not performing at, give them those opportunities to improve, give them the training and so forth and set those deadlines. So no real difference between a probationary period and a normal employee who's not under a probationary period so far as performance reviews are concerned. So just going back to the discipline one, the first thing you must do after you've had a look at something and decided that you do need to deal with a disciplinary issue is to tell people what the allegations are. And this is often not done. People just say there's a problem, but they don't actually give people the details. You need to tell them what it is they're alleged to have done, when they're alleged to have done it, uh, who saw them allegedly doing it, provide them with the documentary uh, evidence and so forth, the um, security camera footage, the emails that have been printed out and so forth. You need to provide all that to them because they have to have a fair opportunity to respond to the allegations. And if you don't tell them what the allegation is and you don't give them the background material, they don't have that fair opportunity to prepare a response and to respond. Uh, now, I've just got a question about do, do they need to know that there is a security camera? It depends. Um, if you are going to put up a security camera generally, uh, then yes, you should tell people that there are cameras operating uh, so that they're aware of that. If, for example, you suspect something's happening, in other words, someone is stealing money out of the till, you don't need to tell them that you're sticking a camera right above the till to try and see if they're doing it because that would defeat the purpose of having the security cameras. So you can put that in surreptitiously, little tiny ones the size of a pin can be put in now, and they're almost impossible to see. So you don't have to tell them, but once you've collected the footage, you must raise the allegation with them and tell them and show them that footage so that they've got that. So you need to raise those allegations and you should do that in writing. You should give them a letter setting out the allegations Now, you should consider whether you need to suspend them. Now, you can't suspend someone without asking for their feedback on whether they should be suspended or not. So you need to go through a, a small process whereby you tell them of what the allegations are, you tell them you're considering suspending them, and you ask for their feedback on whether or not they should be suspended. So say, for example, they are accused of punching one of their co-workers. You might be considering suspending them while you investigate that. You might say to them that you're doing that, and they might say, well, look, I could just work from home during the investigation. And that might be a way around it. They're not in physical contact with the other person. They're not uh, going to be able to punch them again if they did in the first, first place. And therefore, there's no need to suspend. You just have them work from home during that period. Or you might move them to another work site or something similar. So suspensions are only when you need to suspend. If someone's been stealing money out of your bank account, you probably don't want them having access to your computer systems and so forth to cover their tracks. So you'd want to suspend in those circumstances. So you would cut off their access and so forth. But you do need to talk to them about potential suspension before you actually suspend them. But you can take steps to protect yourself uh, from them taking any action um, while you're going through that process. So make sure that they can't access your bank accounts and so forth during that process. You've raised the allegations with them. You've got to give them the opportunity to respond to those allegations and to comment on them. Now, that should be done in person, face-to-face, -face, if it's possible to do so. If not, you might do it by way of Zoom. Um, and if 
you really can't do it by way of Zoom, you might ask them to respond in writing, but you should offer them the opportunity for that face-to-face -face or Zoom uh, because that's an ability for them to meet with you and to front up and to respond to the allegations. You can obviously see body language and so forth much better in a person-to-person -person as well uh, than a Zoom and certainly much better than just getting written responses. So for that first meeting, I would, I would suggest you go for a person-to-person -person meeting. Now, sometimes I see that a person is alleged to have done something really serious and they're asked to come to a meeting immediately or in an hour. Now that's not reasonable. The person needs an opportunity to consider the allegations that have been raised, to consider all the material that you've given them. They need to be able to go off and find themselves a support person or an, an employment lawyer or an advocate. That person has to be up to speed and then available. So if it's a serious matter, I would suggest that at least seven days should be between when you raise the allegations and have your suspension meeting and then have your full meeting at least a week later. Don't leave it any longer than that. Um, give them the week. If they need more time, they can come back and ask for it, but set a, set a week to start with. If it's not so serious, say for example, it's just swearing and you want to talk to them about that, it might only need to be a day or so between those allegations because you're not going to dismiss them. Now, someone's asked if they resign during an allegation and refuse to go through the disciplinary process, what do you do? Well, you can't stop someone from resigning, but they have to give notice. So depending on what your notice period is, they have to give that notice period. Um, you can accept their resignation. In fact, you can't refuse to accept their resignation. We don't have slavery, so someone is entitled to resign. They don't have to go through the disciplinary process, but you're entitled to carry on with the disciplinary process whether they go through it or not. So say, for example, they just refuse to turn up, say, no, I'm resigning, I'm out of here, and they walk away, they don't come back, and they refuse to attend the meeting. You just carry on with the information you've already got. The meeting was their opportunity to respond and to give their side of the story. If they refuse to do that, you can act on, this, on the information you've got from other sources. For example, the documents or the person who saw them punch the other person, the person who was punched, their version of events, that sort of thing. You don't have to wait for the other person if they refuse to take part in it. The court has also said that if an employee refuses to take part in the response, that is actually not being uh, open and communicative as well. Right, so you have your meeting, and we've talked about what happens if they refuse to come. At the meeting, you need someone to take notes. Now, there are a couple of ways you can take notes, and we'll talk about those, but it's really important to have notes because if you don't make notes, the court will look at it and say, well, how could you consider what they said and take that into account and ask other people about it and follow up on it if you haven't written it down and haven't kept notes? So I would suggest you take a support person of your own into a disciplinary meeting, someone whose job it is to take the notes. Get them to record what's said. So in other words, record your invitation to come in and explanation of what the meeting's about uh, record all what the person says in response and record what the next steps will be. Make sure they understand they shouldn't put any comments in the notes. In other words, they shouldn't write down, that sounds like a lie or that's implausible or that's not true. They should just record what the person says because it's a note of what's said during the meeting. So we've talked about a support person, really important that you provide them the opportunity to have a support person. And the support person plays an important role for them. It's not just a hand-holding position, as we talked about before, who can talk to, talk to them about what was said and so forth. But it can also be a representative. For example, it might be a union delegate, it might be an employment advocate, or it might be an employment lawyer. They can actually do all the talking on behalf of the employee, if that's what the employee wants. And you can't insist on talking only to the employee. The advocate can do the talking for them. That's, that can be their role. So make sure you allow them to do that. Just You can ask questions of the employee, but if their advocate answers, that's fine. You just keep on asking questions until you're satisfied with your answers and so forth. 
when you're setting up the meeting, in the letter where you raise the allegations, it's also really important to tell them what the possible outcomes might be should you find the allegations to be true. So say, for example, in the punch situation, the possible outcome might be a warning or it might be dismissal. So you need to tell them the most serious one, it's a potential for dismissal. If you don't tell them that, they won't know that it could be a dismissal and they might not prepare as well as if you, did, as if you had told them. And the court will say that's unfair. You can't take them by surprise with a dismissal when you haven't told them that that's a potential outcome. So let them know the possible outcomes in, in the first letter. Once you've had the meeting and you've got their responses, you need to decide on the facts. Are the allegations true or not? That's your only outcome at this point. You're just deciding, is what's alleged true? Did it actually happen? In other words, they're accused of stealing money out of the till. Can you see them doing that on the, on the video? Is money missing? Do you accept their explanation that they were taking the money out to take it to the bank for you? Those sort of things. Decide what the facts are. You're not deciding on penalty at this point. You're only deciding on the outcome of the allegation. Once you've decided on the outcome of the allegations, you've got to advise them what those outcomes are. So you would set out in another letter that you have looked at the 15 allegations and that one is true because, two is not true because, and so forth. You'd go through the allegations and set out your findings and your reasons that back up those findings and the documents and so forth which support each finding. Really important to do that. So the Employment Relations Authority and the court can see that you have carefully considered each allegation, you've carefully matched up the evidence to the allegation, and you've reached an outcome or a decision which a reasonable employer could make. It's not a decision which every employer would make, it's would, could a reasonable employer reach that decision? So that, that's the test. So make sure you give your reasons. Once you've given your decision on the facts, you should also tell them what you're considering as a possible outcome. So in, our, in other words, is it going to be a warning? Is it going to be a dismissal and so forth? And you tell them that and you give them an opportunity to comment on it. Now, that is a bit like in a criminal case where someone is, say, for example, charged with burglary. You have the jury trial, the jury finds them guilty and then the judge will get comments from the lawyers on what the penalty should be. So it's a similar sort of process. In other words, they might say, well, yes, I did punch them, but they'd just stabbed me with a knife and so forth, so I was a bit angry. So you might take all that into account. Now, there's a whole range of penalties which you can come up with. Um, one of them might be to do nothing. You might decide, yes, in fact, it's true, but in this particular circumstance, I'm going to do nothing further. They've had a a sort of a, a warning through the process. Someone's asked about multiple allegations in one, one letter. And you can have multiple different options or multiple different outcomes. Yes, that's right. You might have several allegations in the letter. One of them might be swearing, one of them might be punching. They might get a warning for the swearing, they might get dismissed for the punching and so forth. So yes, you can have different outcomes for different findings, and that all depends on the seriousness. So one of the other things you can do is give a verbal warning, but you'll note on the screen that I've said it should be in writing. Um, that is because it's not given verbally. It has to be given in writing. Uh, it's only a verbal warning because it's lesser than a written warning, and that's just a legal trap to put you off. So be, be careful that you put your verbal warnings in writing give them a copy, put a copy on their file and hold on to that. It might be a written warning and that could be first, second, third, final, permanent warning, right? There are all sorts of different warnings. You don't have to go through one, two, three and final, then dismissal. If the facts justify dismissal at any particular time, you can skip over all those warnings and you can go straight to the appropriate penalty. The appropriate penalty for something might be dismissal, whether they've ever done something like this before or not. Or it might be that you've given a warning previously, so you can go up to something higher. 
So just consider what is the appropriate penalty for the circumstances. Now, you advise them of what the penalty is going to be, and then make sure you keep that in writing. Keep a copy of that. Put that letter in writing and give them a copy of it. So what the penalty is, what the outcome is. If it's a dismissal, you would need to tell them whether it's on notice. In other words, you're going to pay them for their notice period, or it's not on notice, it's immediate. In other words, they're dismissed without notice, and you don't pay them out the notice period. If you do decide to dismiss with it on notice, you might also decide if you've got a clause that allows you to do this, to pay them out in lieu of that notice if you don't want them back in the workplace. So you can decide to do that. Right, the next thing to talk about is if you've got a poor culture and you've got bullying and stuff carrying on in the workplace, this is, this is something which will destroy your workplace if it's not dealt with properly. Um, don't sweep it under the carpet. Don't think it'll just get better. Um, I've just been given a 10 minute warning, just checking. I think we can cover everything in, in a few minutes and then we've got some more time for questions. So don't sweep bullying under the carpet. If you ignore it, it'll just get worse and you must deal with it. So what you need to do is to encourage teamwork, not before poor behavior and backstabbing. If you stamp out the backstabbing and poor behavior carefully and in private with the person who's doing it, you will get a much better result. So, so get on with that. It comes back to that getting the right fit when you're hiring. Some people ask me, should they hire, hold off dealing with it to preserve the relationship they've got with the person? And I tell them that a relationship built on bad behavior is not actually worth preserving. So deal with it. If they pull their socks up and behave, that's great. You've dealt with it. If they don't, then you deal with it by way of a disciplinary issue and you move them on if that's appropriate. Now, when you're dealing with a redundancy situation, it's really important that you check their employment agreement and follow any process that you've got in there. You should come up with a proposal as to what you are going to be doing or looking to do. Remember, it's only a proposal at this point, and you provide that to them with the supporting material. I've just got a question about maternity leave. We might come back to that in a minute if we can. So provide them with the proposal and supporting material and give them that opportunity to comment on that give their feedback on what the proposal is and remind them they can get a support person to assist them. You've got to consider that feedback uh, and then make other inquiries to see whether you're going to stick to your original process or original um, proposal or whether you're going to change it. And it's important that you make notes and give reasons why you're sticking with what you're doing and so forth and what you've considered in the feedback. If you need to make significant changes to your proposal following the feedback, I suggest it's a good idea to go back with another proposal because people might have given certain feedback based on the first proposal. If the second proposal is significantly different, they might want to give some different feedback. So go back with another proposal. If it's only minor tweaks, then you don't need to do that. You can just tell them what the outcome is. So you make your decisions. Now, really important that you don't rush through a restructure because that will be seen as unfair, but also don't dawdle because it causes tremendous stress to someone if they're kept wondering whether they're going to be made redundant for a long period of time. And it's not good for the organisation to, to dawdle through the process. Move along as fast as you can. And we've talked about what happens if there are significant changes. Now, domestic violence leave is something which has come in in recent times, and this is um, available to someone after they've been employed for six months employment, and it's up to 10 days a year. So that's every year. They can have up to 10 days for dealing with the effects of domestic violence. But the incident which they're dealing with may have been before they commenced employment with you. So really important to remember that. It might have been before they joined you. could have even been years ago. They are required to provide proof that they have suffered from domestic violence and that they do need this leave to deal with the effects of domestic violence, but it can be from a long time ago. And it might be a police report or a medical report. 
Now, it also applies if the, if the violence was towards someone who was a dependent, for example, a child or someone they're looking after, not just towards the employee. So just bear that in mind. Now, the leave is not accumulated. So if they don't use 10 days one year, they don't get 20 the next. It's only ever up to 10 in a year. They can also seek short-term variations to their employment agreement due to domestic violence. For example, they might want to work from a different location or work part-time for a period. They can ask for that and you should consider that. That can be up to two months in duration. Now, there's a section here on COVID pay. Um, and COVID pay, sick leave on COVID pay is at their normal rate. Um, if they're unable to work for four or more days, you can apply for a COVID sick leave payment. For a full term, for a full time employee, that's around six hundred dollars at the moment. For someone who works less than twenty hours a week, it's about three hundred and something. But it's still available. So if someone does have COVID, you can apply for that. It's very easy to apply online. If they qualify and you claim that payment, they don't lose their sick days for the days they were off sick. Uh, so make sure that you credit those sick days back when you get that payment from the government. Now, just in conclusion, before we have any further questions, make sure that everything you do is fair and reasonable. Follow the proper process. If you follow the proper process, the courts will normally support you because they won't be putting their business decisions in your place. They will just be looking as to whether you've been fair and reasonable in your process. Make sure any decisions you reached are based on evidence. Can you support the decisions? Have you got the documents? Have you got the, the evidence? And keep an open mind and don't jump to conclusions. It's no good going in already having decided that this person's guilty and that you're going to get rid of them and stuff. Go in looking for the evidence, then make your decisions. And my, my last test I say to people is treat people how you would want your loved ones to be treated. And if you do that, that's a really good, really good test to apply. Now, just going back to some questions which have popped up, there's one about fixed term. If you employ someone to cover maternity leave and the, and the maternity leave comes back earlier, will the fixed term contract come to an end? Yes, so the fixed term contract will come to an end when the person comes back earlier. So long as you put that in your agreement with them, that that was how the fixed term would be worked out. In other words, it's the maternity leave, but if the person comes back early, the fixed term will come to an end. So yes, you can do that. I'm just looking down for the next question. Just having trouble finding it. Oh, it's a COVID leave one. Do you need to pay staff the top up? What happens if the employee doesn't have sick leave or annual leave? So yes, if the person's away sick and the, and the, the amount of pay you receive from the government doesn't cover it, you need to pay them any sick leave. Uh, you need to top up their normal pay to, the, to what they would get for sick leave. If they don't have sick leave or annual leave, then you don't have to pay them that top up. A question regarding, back to uh, another question regarding sick leave. Sick leave. Uh, yeah. So the question is, do you have to roll over sick leave to a maximum of 20 or is this an option? And yes, you do have to roll over sick leave. If someone doesn't use sick leave, say for example, they've got 10 up their sleeve and they don't use them, they can keep them up to a maximum of 20. You cannot take those away. So that any one year they could have 20 if they didn't use any in previous years. Yes, but you can't accumulate them to 20, 40, 60. No, not unless yeah. your employment agreement says that you can, which mm. which mm. That would not be a good good idea. Yeah, and I know the thing, you know, for me that I still, and, and I'm sure the people on the webinar as well, uh, for those in business will be spotting and coming up with uh, you know the the reports on the determinations out of the employment court, there doesn't seem to be any reduction in volume of of employers having to to stump up and uh, and defend positions where they've not followed process, which just seems to be the the common theme for them. Um, I'm not quite sure whether the term's losing or, or having a decision not in their favour. So, uh, you know, and from your experience, which I'm sure you've seen in plenty of cases, that it's a small price to pay to engage an expert 
at the beginning of something that's going a little bit, um, you know, maybe not quite so uh, rosy in the employment situation than it is to DIY and sort of hope for the best and uh, it all going pear-shaped uh, down the track. Yeah, the, the investment you make up front can be reasonably small to get the process right. Uh, if you get it wrong, the investment you have to make later to deal with the Employment Relations Authority or the Mediation Service or the Employment Court and so forth will be enormous compared to what an initial investment might have been. I can see we've got a couple more questions pop up. Uh, yep, one far away. Redundancy. Um, do you have to have this discussion on redundancy with just one person or do you need to involve all staff? You need to involve all of the people who the redundancy might impact. So in other words, if some one person's going to lose their job, uh, you need to involve all of the people who might be that one person. Say, for example, you've got five people making widgets and you decide you might only need three people to make widgets. You need to have that discussion with all five people who are making widgets now um, and their manager and so forth to, to make sure that your proposal is well thought through and that everybody involved gets an opportunity to, to comment on it. You, d you don't have to go wider than those people, though. You don't have to have that discussion with your other 300 employees. Mm -hmm. It's only with those who will be impacted by your proposal. Uh, now, someone's also asked, any thoughts on fair pay agreements? Well, we really don't have any in play at the moment because they don't start coming into effect or start to be able to even be negotiated until the 1st of December. It will be interesting to see whether unions and things can get the required number of people to be able to have uh, negotiations across a wide range of, of industries. It'll be interesting to see how that will work because employers have for so long been able to negotiate with their own employees. Um, if they are in an industry where the union can get at least a thousand people, or I think it's ten percent of a workforce, um, then it'll be very interesting to see how employers will choose their their negotiators and things like that. It's too early for me to say whether they're going to work or they're not going to work. Um, I, I, can't, I don't really have any other comments at this point. Mm, okay. Well, we've reached finish time, so I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. So what I would like to do is thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you for your questions, which I think have just added some really great flavour uh, to the day and sort of expanded on, on Alan's presentation as well. So uh, that just leaves me to thank you, Alan, for your contribution. Uh, it's been fantastic once again, and I think the employment uh, law field does appear to be one that's ever changed changing, you know, from my observation, just about near impossible for your, uh, you know, your, your business owner in New Zealand to actually be on top of. So I've really mm -hmm. enjoyed the session uh, and we've very much appreciated you giving your time and expertise, uh, you know, to, to the webinar and um, having it made available uh, to, um, to record as well. So with that, we'll say uh, farewell and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us. So goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.